You were wondering, weren't you, where we were going to stream from today? This is Concordia Lutheran Church at the mouth of Barefoot Bay. It's an interesting church in that this Lutheran church has a Presbyterian pastor, Dr. Jim Spinogel. We'll meet him in just a moment. Pastor here is Jim Spinogel. There he is holding the door Hi open there. for us. And we're gonna ask him to give us an elevator speech about who he is and who this church is. Just a minute of each. Go ahead, Jim, tell us. All right, well, uh, start with me, start with me. I am a, uh, I've been here about 10 years, so a little bit more than that. I am kind of an odd person here in one sense, in one sense because I'm not Lutheran, I'm Presbyterian and uh, have been serving this church in what they call extended service. We are a, uh, uh, we share communion with, uh, with the ELCA, and so I'm glad to be a part of, part of this. I'm part-time here. I also part, am part-time uh, working as a substance abuse counselor. Uh, I have enjoyed my time here and uh, glad to be a part of the, this church. Uh, this church has been a part of uh, Barefoot Bay. It serves the regional area, but uh, it's, it's right here at the entrance to the to the bay, and we have most of our membership comes from uh, from right here. It's uh, very active with the ecumenical food pantry. Uh, also, we have a ministry doing uh, doing quilts for the Lutheran World Relief, which they were sent around the world, and uh, that's uh, very very happy to be able to be doing those. Uh, we're a small church, but very active and faithful with uh, following, following the Lord and wanting to share the gospel with our community. This is the uh, foyer, the narthex, and uh, what a pretty entrance. And Jim is turning up the lights, and Rochelle is going to find where the piano is. And uh, in just a moment, we are going to be inside. In a moment, you're going to be able to see the chancel and communion table but let me uh, show you the rest of the sanctuary do uh, notice the congo drums over conga drums over there and the nice uh, lit up lord's prayer embroidery and the font the baptismal font is a giant clamshell and it's at the entrance of the church because the way you get into the church is by being baptized and uh, then of course there's the choir loft and here's where rochelle will be playing the music for today. We are so glad again to be in this sanctuary. Our thanks to the people of Concordia Lutheran. It is so great to be at Concordia Lutheran Church here and have Jim uh, welcome us in. And uh, it's such a neat sanctuary too. I want to make a couple of announcements as we get started. First of all, the session will meet on the 26th, that's this Tuesday, to discuss when and how to open. So stay tuned. As always, you can get information from our website, from our Facebook page, or from the e-devotional. The website is welovefirst.org. The Facebook page is facebook.com slash welovefirstsebastian. And the e-devotional can be signed up for by calling or emailing the church office or signing up yourself at the website. Nancy Ornsdorf's brother is in hospice and she has flown to be with him. We wanna be praying for that family. And I wanna call us to worship today with the same words that we used last week, but adding a couple more. Let us boldly approach the throne of grace and these are the words he added, that we may find help in every time and grace for every need. Let us worship God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, the forgiveness of sins, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. God, be with us in these moments before you. Nurture our hearts. Help us to enjoy you. We want to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. As I get started with this message today, I'm remembering that it is Memorial Day, and I want us all to remember the men and women who have died in the service of this country. Let's take a second just to think about that. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers, bearing crosses or stars of David, they add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Today we pray that those who lie here have found peace with their Creator, and we resolve that their sacrifice will always be remembered by a grateful nation. The fallen give silent witness to the price of our liberty, and our nation honors them this day and every day. Last week, we talked about in Acts chapter 1, how Jesus went up, and then in Acts chapter 2, how the Spirit would come down. Jesus goes up in Acts chapter 1. In inaugural fashion, he ascends to the throne. And in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes down in helping fashion. The promised Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh. These two events in these two chapters actually cover three different weeks. Last week, we had Jesus ascend. Next week, we have Jesus descend. But here we are in the middle. What do we do in the middle? 
What did the disciples do in the middle? This is the word of God. Listen carefully. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. That is our text for today. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brother. They were devoting themselves to prayer. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Amen. So what are we to do in this middle week? What did the disciples do? They prayed. In this middle week, I want to ask you how you're doing with prayer. Lord, this is a time of meditation and preaching upon your word. We ask that your spirit would be in it in such a way that we are strengthened and you are glorified. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer. They were devoted to prayer. I want to ask prayer. What is it? Prayer. Why do it? Prayer. How do you do it? Prayer. What is it? Prayer. Why do it? Prayer. How do you do it? Well, what is it? Prayer is communicating with God. I didn't say talking with God because talking is mainly words and communication is more than words. You can touch someone and communicate, can't you? You can give them a present and communicate, can't you? You can simply be with them silently and communicate, can't you? Yes, this is about communicating with God. I suppose if you wanted to, and I don't know why you wouldn't, you could say that prayer is orienting yourself toward God so as to engage him and to be with him. When prayer is thought about like that, you can realize you can be in church, in worship, and have the pastor be praying, and you're not praying because your soul is not consciously turned towards God. You're thinking about a sports event that afternoon. You're thinking about how long the church service is going to be. You're thinking about what's for lunch. But you see, for prayer to be prayer, the essence of prayer is that our souls are turned toward God to meet with him. In the Old Testament, we learn about the tent of meeting. I think that's a perfect picture for what prayer is. You see, a tent is portable and you can go wherever you want to go. But when you turn to meet with God, you're praying. So that's what prayer is. It is communicating with God. It is meeting with God. Well, why pray? You tell me, because the Bible says so. And that's a good answer. It does say so. It says, for example, be anxious about nothing, pray about, pray about everything. So you're absolutely right. But I want to ask the question again, why pray? Especially if God is going to do what God is going to do, period. Why bother with prayer? Well, is it true that God is simply going to do what God is going to do? I ask you to remember Adam and Eve in the original garden. Didn't God say, here's this wonderful planet. I want you to have dominion, name the animals, and let's walk in the evening and talk. And you tell me about why you're doing what you're doing and what you're thinking and what you need help with. In other words, God from the beginning has been interested in collaboration. And collaboration means that there are inputs from the different parties and that there's a mutual decision-making process. So you see, everything isn't set. We are involved in the setting. I also think of being a father and how if my children ask, there are some things I will never, ever, ever do. They can ask a million times. They can ask sweetly. They can scream and shout, but I will never do it because in my wisdom, I know it is not for their good or right for them. Now, oppositely, that's true as well. There are some things I will always, always do for them, whether they remember to ask or not. If they do, so much the better. 
For example, if they wanted to ask for how to do something right or lovingly, I'm all over that. But there's also a middle area. This is a middle Sunday. There's a middle area. And that is those things that I would not do, but I will do since they asked. For example, I'm not a big fan of miniature golf, but if my son says, will you play miniature golf with me this afternoon? I will. Why? Because he asked. So there is an open-endedness in life that has to do with collaboration. It has to do with asking. I remember one person said, when I'm working on something like, I don't know, maybe a rusty pipe, I remind myself, it's never just me and the pipe. God is there, and I invite him in to helping me with that pipe. I think that says what prayer is about nicely, why we pray. We invite God in to help us do things that he has not necessarily set in stone. We have a way of collaborating with God. Now, how do you pray? Well, so far, I've given us a picture of prayer, the tent of meeting. I've given us a good reason to pray, collaboration. Now, let me give us a word for how to pray, and that word is childlike. Childlike. Jesus said that in profound ways, you must be like a child with me. And what I notice most about children is that they are simple and direct. And I think that's what God wants for us in prayer. Not to make it too complicated, not to use a lot of religious or flowery language, but to be simple and direct. Now, most of the time when we're being childlike in prayer in this way, we're going to use words. But we can also use music. We can use painting and art. We can use dance. We can use our bodies like laying prostrate or kneeling. And I would also suggest maybe we want to take each of those in turn for a season so we stay fresh with our praying. I've always loved the story of Jacqueline Dupre, one of the great cellists of the world. She actually had to retire at age 28 because of multiple sclerosis. The story is that when she was six and having her first recital, in that recital hall, she was running down one of the hallways, and she had her cello over her head, and she had a giant grin on her face. And somebody seeing her interpreted that this way. They interpreted that she had just finished and was celebrating, and they said, so you just finished, did you? You just finished playing? And she smiled and hollered over her shoulder, no, I'm going to play. That kind of enthusiasm, I want to say to you this, prayer is good. It is simple. Run for it. Smile and pray. That's the word of the Lord for this middle Sunday. God bless you. Let us pray. God, this isn't just a perfunctory set of words. I am turning in my heart and soul towards you. And I'm asking my brothers and sisters listening to do the same with their hearts and souls. We want to engage you. We want you to be our good, our hope, and our love. So keep us praying. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Now, brothers and sisters, remember, wherever you are, Christ has put you there. There's something he wants to do through you there. And wherever you go, Christ is sending you. The indwelling Christ has something he wants to do through you there. Believe this. Rely on his power, his grace, and his love. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. Go in peace, brothers and sisters.